Also, because of the long exposure time in shooting this picture, no one was standing still. Uh, so you don't get any people in this view, which is a little bit odd. Uh, the other thing in here, though, I do want to make sure you notice is in, in the opening right there, you, you can, if you've been drawn to it. <laughs> when you look in there, you know right away what it is. It's the remains of one of those crapper devices that I was obsessing about a couple minutes ago, back at Doc Maynard's. The thing of interest, it's raised up about three feet. The reason was the reverse flush. <laughs> if it was going to shoot up and attack, <laughs> Elevate! And some of these were raised as high as 10 to 12 feet in the air, and then you climb up the ladder or a set of stairs. <laughs> I'm not dwelling on the subject for the entire tour, but I did want you to notice this. Also, uh, I've done a lot of tours over the years, but my, uh, my favorite question ever asked was on a school tour, a third grader, and a young fellow, he raised his hand, and he asked if they always had a viewing window. I <laughs> <laughs> think so. And then the other thing, that question for you, uh, have any of you ever seen an authentic crapper device with a crapper name on it? We actually didn't get the, the, the gentleman from England. It, 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 we have one at the end of the tour of our museum. Bill Spidell, uh, back in 85, he went on a trip to England and he found a store called Sitting Pretty. He paid $5,000 for it. And it's a beautiful antique uh, crapper device with a crapper name on the tank portion up above. And the only disturbing thing is the porcelain base. It's beautifully decorated and it reminds people of sometimes of their china patterns. <laughs> Necessarily an association you know, really want to have, but uh, so so that's coming up later. Are you excited? <laughs> <laughs> Wedding in San Francisco. Legend used to be that it was a firefighter's convention, but it actually was a relative's <laughs> wedding. And uh, they tried three major approaches to firefighting. The first was the city's water system, quite logically, and they couldn't get enough pressure to do much that day. The second thing was pumping water from the bay. They had done that for previous fires, but with, that was one of the lowest tides in the year that afternoon. The tide receded so far that their equipment would not reach. And then the third approach to firefighting was dynamite. <laughs> Literally, it was dynamite. Uh, the idea was uh, create a fire uh, wall, so a fire, uh, that's not the, the right term, is it? A fire break, yeah, so it couldn't spread. And part of the problem was that the munitions chief uh, involved with dealing with this had not had a lot of recent experience and waited a little too long and ended up blowing up buildings that had already caught on fire, which is about the last thing you want to do when you're fighting a fire. I also remember reading that the firefighters completely just gave up at the point where it, uh, the fire hit a munition storage area, and literally the fire started fighting back. And they said, enough, enough, out of here. The other things, uh, this isn't related to the Seattle fire, but I did want to let y'all know this, that about this tour, I mentioned to a couple people in the front of the group earlier that uh, if you'd come through in 65 with Bill Spidell, you would have all gone through with flashlights. Uh, you would have all paid one dollar to do the tour in 65. Uh, there was a lot more rubble on the ground, much like you see in this space uh, throughout the area. A lot of stuff that you were stepping over. Uh, because of the buildings, so many of them were abandoned, it wasn't unusual to actually be stepping over someone sleeping it off from the night before <laughs> when you came through. Uh, also, no kids under 17 were allowed on the tour for the first couple of years. And the reason for that was Bill's very developed vocabulary. <laughs> you never knew what he was going to say. Just to give you a feeling for Bill Spidell, he used to say that the old timers who'd hang out in this neighborhood, that they were called habitues, and that the younger, more aggressive types who were hanging out in the neighborhood, they were sons of habitues. <laughs> See, some of you may not have appreciated Bill Spidell fully. I have that sense. 
Bill also used to tell guides that if we didn't offend at least one person in the course of a tour, we weren't doing a good job. So that gives you a little idea of what he was like. The other thing I wanted to mention before we head out of here is the street back there was a very famous one. And the reason was two years before the fire, a business occupation study done revealed that we had a very large number of single young women employed along the street as seamstresses or garment workers. And at that time, they were aware of industries like, well, logging was pretty obvious, but coal production, shipbuilding, shipping and trading, hop growing but they weren't aware of such a sizable garment district. So they formed a government committee to investigate. A lot of gentlemen involved in city operations volunteered to be part of the committee. Six selected, they hot-footed it off to Occidental Avenue for three weeks of what was later described as exhaustive research. You're with me. Yeah. Came back with the news, couldn't find a sewing machine. It was a thriving red light district, but then the question became, what should be done? And in true Seattle style, this was debated for the next 50, 60 years. <laughs> but the original thought was, we make money. They set up a seamstress tax. It was $10 per month per seamstress per sewing machine, <laughs> so to speak. And the taxes on the seamstressing provided a nice chunk of the city's operating budget, and it gave rise to a very famous Seattle slogan, which was, a stitch in time will cost you two bucks. <laughs> Sorry it doesn't rhyme. I don't have anything to do with that. But that was the street back there. The Oriental Hotel, you may have noticed a, some, a sign back there that said Oriental Hotel. That was a seamstress establishment back at the turn of the century. This space, when it was in operation, it was a saloon burlesque called, it was called the Bijou Theater. It was sort of one step removed from being a seamstress establishment. Uh, we're going to go outside, and I want to make sure I caution you about this. When we go outside, we're in the middle of a city alley. I have not yet been up there this morning, so my advice is take a really good deep breath of fresh air down here. And with exposure to ultraviolet rays of light over decades of time, it changes color. It takes a little bit longer here in Seattle than in some places. But it becomes quite a, sort of a dark purple violet color. And when we walk over these, I think some of you are going to be very surprised at how different they are on the two sides. Uh, Another thing about the skylights, besides that they were once very common in these sidewalks, and they do bring a lot of light down here, even on overcast days, it's fairly bright down here with the amount of light. But uh, we uh, do a lot of school tours in this business in the springtime, and when you're working with younger kids, uh, quite often you do group screams <laughs> here to try and get the attention of people up there. And 30, 40 kids screaming to get someone stopping. And the best response we've ever had to this was about 20 years back. A guy was down here with a group of first graders, and the kids were yelling, help as loudly as they could. At that time, one of the pieces up there towards the middle that's plugged up, there's that one there and there's another one there, one of those two was open. And you could see all the way through, the glass had been chipped out, knocked out. And this man up above heard the kids screaming and he walked over and he saw the opening, so he knelt down, bent down, put his eye to the opening. The kids down here got a little bit more than they bargained on. But they saw this eye staring at them. And it was a fairly bloodshot looking eye. The kids really started screaming. And the man stayed in place for about half a minute. He got up, walked away, later reported back to our ticket office that he had turned to someone else who was on the corner, announced quite dramatically that the sidewalks were talking. And that gives you a pretty good feeling for walking around with the neighbors on a regular basis. Someone was asking about this earlier on the tour, but do keep in mind that the term Skid Row, it comes from logging towns. It originally was Skid Road, R-O-A-D. The street right there, Yesler Way, was one Seattle Skid Road. It was three times steeper than it is today, and it was lined with logs across the street. The tops of the logs were rubbed down with dogfish oil on a regular basis, and that was so that the logs would be nice and, and, and slick and bringing the logs down the road, they'd move faster 
on, on, on their route to the Yesler sawmill. Uh, probably the worst job in a logging town was to be one of the boys or young men working out there with the dogfish oil because you smelled so bad at the end of your work shift that you had to be housed separately from the people of the men working in the sawmill. And my guess is that after 12 hours, a 12 hour shift in the Yesler sawmill, you probably weren't all that much of a picnic to be around. <laughs> Yes, it was Hayes, Rutherford Hayes, one of those, those big names that we all know a lot about today. And the people in town, they were very excited about having a presidential visit. It isn't like today where they can fly in and fly out kind of thing. And it was a big commitment. They wanted to give him a gift that reflected the excitement. And so they gave him a log. <laughs> they gave him a hundred foot long log. And I've always wanted, wished to, that I could go back in time and see the look on President Hayes' face when he got his 100-foot-long log. He left on a ship that was not going to easily accommodate a 100-foot-long log. He left it here, and he was not re-elected. <laughs> Once more, you get into that whole debate, do you accept the gifts or not? Uh -oh. <laughs> but uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you about here is everyone caught up there. We need to move it just a little bit there. Oh, yeah, we do. Uh, in a moment or two, I'll turn you loose, and up ahead is museum space. If you go in there, don't miss the beautiful antique crapper device I mentioned earlier. But also, don't miss the photograph of the leading sewing circle of the 1890s. Uh, Lou Graham is on the left in the picture. She was the CEO of Seamstress Activity, sort of the Heidi Fleiss of Seattle. And she died in 1903, left in a state of over a quarter million, and a good chunk of the money went to the King County Public Schools. Sixty years go by, Bill Spidell writes about her. Bill's book is banned <laughs> by the King County Public Schools <laughs> because of the chapter on Madame Lou. And there was never a school named after, not even a playground at one of the existing schools. So don't miss Lou in the photograph. And uh, eventually, though, you're going to need to backtrack.